Hello, world singers. My name is Tyler. And my name is Brooke. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Conversations. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for being here because we have one of the most well-researched and I think important episodes for you today. Significant amount. This was very research intensive. (laughs) I used all four of the books and pretty much every online resource as well. The, uh, The interactive map, the arcanum, the wiki, the like off brand wikis. If it exists out there as a possible (laughs) research, it has been picked through bit by bit because in this episode, which is as always, hashtag all spoilers all the time, we are talking about everything in the possible Cosmere. Yeah, big spoilers. So turn back now if I don't know why you're here, but if for some reason you're (laughs) listening to this episode and you have not read all of the Stormlight Archive books, turn back now. Because we are going to be looking at the entirety of Shalon Devar's timeline from her birth up until the present moment, everything that we know of through Rhythm of War. The reason for doing so, I think, is obvious and immediately Yeah, this has been one of the biggest questions and, like, areas of speculation since Rhythm of War came out. And clearly one of the things that Brandon has seen as like the primary or one of the primary mysteries. Yeah. Like she is providing a lot of the intrigue where Kaladin is very straightforward with like sadness and stuff. Supers. (laughs) And (laughs) that's perfect. Kaladin, Colden, sadness and stuff. Shalon, though. That's the name of his uh, spinoff series. Yeah. It's going to be great, starring Horn Eaters and Herdaisians. Shalon provides this long-running mystery, and this character who is unsure of herself is an unreliable narrator, is, as we've previously mentioned, literally like snapping in and out of moments in her own life as people are talking to her. It triggers Mm -hmm. something traumatic, a traumatic memory, and she like snaps time mentally, skips over the time so that she can like blank out and get to a more comfortable moment this uh this research and like laying out this timeline i actually found it super helpful and made me a little bit more like empathetic or understanding of shalon i was like oh i feel like i kind of get it now okay i see where you're at girl yes and i think that's the most important thing with this episode it is for us looking back In the future, so that we can see and gain that whole perspective on Shallan without the reading of it, which is always done in this like mysterious kind of fashion. It's so jumbled. Yes. And to be fair, there's still a lot of questions. There's not a whole lot that I think we're going to be able to answer like definitively in this episode. We are going to try to do our best to pin down some of the key points in terms of Shalon's oaths and where she's at in her radiantness and when we are seeing her various radiant accoutrements. Yes, the blades and extras that she has. I think that's going to be primarily the benefit of this episode. And what I would kind of just like to do is let's start at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. After a little bit of listener feedback from our last episode. Yeah, this and this is actually kind of going to tie in. Another thing I got out of laying out this timeline is uh, some potential similarities between Shalon and Adolin in terms of their Spren-ish bonds. So something interesting to keep thinking about. From our last episode on Adolin and Maya, Jaso Beck said, quote, I had a thought about the Adolin Maya bond following the rhythm of war advance of a weapon that can kill kill a spren. What if that doesn't work on a dead eye like Maya? It would be a big shift at some point in book five if that was the case. Just a thought to where these awakened dead eyes could lead to 
in terms of advantages, end quote. I think that's a really interesting speculation about is the concept of permanently kill or kill kill going to be a real threat that the Spren face in the next book and then do the dead eyes either through their knowledge as Spren that we're making this decision in the past and have lived with the consequences for a long time. Mm -hmm. Like we can't be under the assumption that they're not capable of kind of growth and learning yeah because we've obviously talked a lot about how maya is and we should assume that i think there will be a role for that like army of dead eyes that are gathering oh, for sure and they are of course many more of the dead eyes that we've seen than we have seen of shard blades right like there's exactly. a bunch of hidden shard i blades was just out there. thinking like if you were to go to the physical realm location of all of those dead eyes, would it just be like a pile of shard blades? Well, because maybe we, we don't know a lot about that moment when the shard blades are slammed into the ground. Maybe that was a controlled release of their weapons and not all the radiants did that. Maybe there were, I mean, we know that there were other radiant orders that were not so primarily like warrior focus what if all like the truth watchers were just sitting around and just like tossed them into a pile and then just all the radiant orders just like tossed all their shard blades into a pile instead of doing like the fancy thing of like going out on the plains and you just mean like the the, whatever happens at feverstone keep yes right like that moment yeah that obviously couldn't be all all of them i don't think yeah yeah so there could be a big pile somewhere (laughs) that just nobody has uncovered just in some mountain a real high up or something just a backup erythiru you know just a small tower just shard blade tower and they just keep all the shard blades there what a discovery that would be that would be crazy okay let's get into our timeline because we have about five pages of notes to get through so 1156 on rashar shalon is born. Let's just do a quick recap. Her father and his manservant are both part of the Ghost Bloods, which uh, Shalon learns much later on down the line. And her mother is sort of tangentially connected. She knows people in the order of the Skybreakers. And of course, the Skybreakers are on a mission with Nail to prevent new radiance from appearing. There certainly is a lot of questions that I still have about her father in the Ghost Bloods, her mother in the Skybreakers, and then how these two get together and then are also just kind of like random royals. They're not like super powerful royals. No, they're not powerful at all, yeah. which is like the point. And so they were clearly connected and it just kind of begs to question is if you're the most powerful entity a king or a queen a, a colin if you will in society do you really go looking for these kind of mysterious organizations or are the mysterious organizations always operating on like the edge of power not like the oh, complete I center see. but like mm-hmm. you know you're i mean i think it's probably mutual I think it's a mutual sort of attraction situation. I don't think we know exactly when her father became a ghost blood. Her mother obviously knows the Skybreakers when Shalon is young. But again, like unclear if that is the case like from Shalon's birth or is it something relatively new when Shalon is a young child? We don't really know. I don't know if her dad was part of the ghost bloods at that time when she kills her mother or if he goes to them later as a way of boosting their power, boosting their uh, riches as her family sort of declines in both of those things. But just lay in the lay in the groundwork for a Shalon's horrible childhood. <laughs> and at some point in that childhood, exact date is unknown. But before Certainly before she's 10 years old. As probably a, yeah, as something like, like a four young to five. child. Yeah. yeah. She bonds with the cryptic who we now will call Testament. At the time, we believe that that spren would have called itself Pattern, right? Well, yeah. Because they all call themselves Pattern? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, And that's confusing to a young Shallan because then Pattern will return. But to keep it simple and straightforward on the podcast... Will always refer to this first bonding as testament. 
she bonds Testament and begins to develop some powers. There's the specific quote we have here about the moment. Quote, playing in the gardens as a child, meeting a cryptic, a beautiful spiraling spren that dimpled the stone, wonderful times spent hidden among the foliage in their special place. The cryptic encouraged her to become strong enough to help her family, to stand against the terrible darkness spreading through it. Such a blessed time full of hope and joy and truths spoken easily with the solemnity and wonder of a child, end quote. That last line about truth spoken easily is, of course, telling because the key aspect that Shalana is going to deal with the rest of her life is the telling of truths and uncovering these truths that she has hidden in her own mind. It also is truths plural. So that means as a young child, she spoke at least two truths. And that's in addition to the first ideal which is the same for all Radiant Orders, including the Lightweavers, even though their subsequent oaths are different. So I think, I think we can say that as a young child, Shalon had said three quote unquote ideals was a third level Radiant, which also makes sense because we know a few years later in 1167, at the age of approximately 11, Shalon kills her mother with her shard blade. This moment, of course, intense. We are not going to sit on all the intense emotional moments because we're trying to do this yeah. broad timeline. So Shalon kills her mother because her mother is trying to kill Shalon. Her mother is warned either by nail or a member of the Skybreakers that Shalon yeah, has someone, developed. Someone finds out that yes, Shalon. Very confusing. Like why someone found out yeah, Shalon's... the reveal is not really talked about, which is actually an interesting question. Shalon doesn't ever like specifically say she was trying to hide her abilities, but she also like says that she is doing most of this bonding with her cryptic like by her... in like a secret place in the yeah, garden. Yeah, it's a so... it's a imaginary friend, but hers is real and gives yeah. her superpowers. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Exactly. How amazing. But. Her mother's tipped off about her daughter. Of course, the Skybreakers want all Radiance to not exist because they see it as the precursor to the desolation instead of the reverse. And in self-defense, Shalon summons what we believe to be Testament Blade. Yeah, I think it has to be Testament Blade at that point. Because the blades are about to get confusing. <laughs> yes. So this... But that one is straightforward. I yes, think. yeah. First summoning of the blade is Testament Blade. And then Shalon is so traumatized by this kind of accidental killing of her mother. Like she wasn't really trying to kill her. She was just trying to protect herself and automatically summoned her blade obviously as an 11 year old is horrified and she breaks her bonds with mm -hmm. testament essentially killing her and she says quote i don't want you i hate you i'm done you never existed you are nothing and i am finished shallan didn't turn away she wouldn't she felt the ripping sensation again the terrible pain and the awful horror end quote and I think this is interesting because as we go through the timeline, we'll see that Shalon does retain some connection to this now dead-eye blade, but she describes this sensation very similar to what Teft feels when uh, Fenderana is like killed, killed. So I'm just really interested in like how how she maintains some of that connection, even though Testament is now a dead eye. Well, I think that is going to be the key point. And as Jasso in the beginning mentioned, there might be some connection to how Adolin is forming a bond with Maya and what Shallan maybe always was capable of or is capable of regaining some bond with Testament. But I think that what she says is really important to me because of the nature of how Sprenner formed around the thoughts and feelings and emotions mm. of human mm -hmm. beings. She 
doesn't just say, I hate you, which is like maybe a very normal thing yeah. to say in that moment. She says, you never existed. You are nothing. And to me, that is kind of the key to this whole situation is that mm. there is a, and she believed it in that way of right. like a horrible situation, like forced her mind to start immediately covering up which and yeah in order for the situation to be somewhat okay the spren blade has to not be real that it's something that is not exist in existence yeah i think it's an important uh thing to for us to keep in mind and shallan's story in general really highlights this but i think it's universally applicable to all of the knights radiant and brandon has said this in multiple words of brandon the Radiant oaths and like basically everything about them, their uh, validity, their ability to be accepted by the spren and honor slash cultivation slash any, you know, higher power that's doing the quote unquote accepting is all about perception. Mm -hmm. These are not actually like universal truths in yes. any way. They are subject to the unique perception of these beings, whether that's a spren or a human. And so I think that really comes into play with Shalon's timeline, that her perception, her ability to recognize and acknowledge things is just as important as like the actual words that she's saying. I 100% agree. And we actually see from Venley's perspective, a character who is continually through Rhythm of War, saying and failing and being rejected mm -hmm. when she attempts to say the words. Yeah. And she's like, no, I totally believe in freedom and cultivation. <laughs> is and her spren are both like, like what? I mean, if that was true, then... Yeah. You just watch the little kid be tortured <laughs> and in a cage yeah. and you just yeah. watch. So yeah, I believe no. in freedom. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I 100% think that it is about the mindset and perception of the individual Certainly not just the words, but what Shalon is going to now begin to go through with just this like multiple traumatic experiences all on top of each other, all happening because of one another, all like interwoven in that weird way that, of course, all of life is, but it's hard to see it this way. But she killed her mother who was attempting to kill her because of testament she killed her mother with testament and then she kills then, testament because of her mother and then that trauma leads to her father eventually becoming such a, a raging alcoholic and an abusive person that she kills her father as well and that trauma then leads her family's financial collapse and her going to see yasna and all of this is you know uh like the snake that eats itself it's just all going round and round and that I think is what Brandon has captured so well with the exploration of trauma and all these different characters mm -hmm. is how it all feeds on itself and one trauma begets another trauma. And Shalon is just our most theatrical presentation of it. <laughs> and I really have loved seeing it in this very clear, straightforward timeline because the next point, which is happening in 1173, is that Shalon becomes Yasna's ward at age 17. At this point, she starts seeing the cryptics. She sort of sees into Shadesmar in a way because she sees the, the full cryptics in their like body form. She starts seeing them in her uh, capital M memories that she takes and drawing them. And then, of course, we have the moment when, quote, she screamed then, jumping to her feet on her bed, dropping the pad, backing against the wall. Before she could consciously think of what she was doing, she was struggling with her sleeve, trying to get the soul caster out. It was the only thing she had resembling a weapon. No, that was stupid. She didn't know how to use it. She was helpless. Except storms, she thought, frantic. I can't use that. I promised myself. She began the process anyway. 10 heartbeats, to bring forth the fruit of her sin, the proceeds of her most horrific act, end quote. Now, this is, of course, happening in Way of Kings. It is 
just at the beginning when we are starting to explore, probably through Adolin or Dalinar, the summoning of the shard blades mm, yeah. and like just learning about the basic magic systems here we have no concept we don't know anything about spren, spren or spren blades like none of that is anywhere close to so this moment i think to me as a reader and generally for a lot of the fandom was oh shallan has a shard blade right that is like the other shard blades and so to me this whole concept of introducing Shallans, I never knew and I never had any guess that there was another pattern. Like that was not oh, of course. on my radar at all. Once you go back and start thinking about it, you're like, oh, so clear. Obviously, because obviously Shallan was not ba- bonded to pattern at this point. So like it, do- it doesn't make any sense. Yes. So again, I think we can say here with pretty much 100% certainty, this would be her testament dead eye blade which again she somehow has retained a bond to well i think that what has happened with shallan and testament it's like a uh, harry potter and voldemort or one cannot live while the other is alive and so this concept of like she shifted her perception when she was younger mm-hmm. and she is still alive and capable of shifting her perception back and therefore the bond can't be completely severed. You know, it's like a matter, it's definitely traumatic and it was like ripped away from her and so it's broken. But I do think that there is an element of like, it wasn't completely severed. Yes, and I think some other evidence for that is that immediately after that quote, she accidentally soul casts for the first time and in that process she mentally speaks to those cryptics she's been seeing and she speaks what i think is going to count as an ideal she says i am terrified and uh the cryptics kind of like okay that works and Mm -hmm. then she soul casts and i think that this is her second ideal because as we said at the top of the episode the first ideal is the same for all orders in book, we do not ever hear Shallan say the first ideal. So my thought is that somehow when she quote unquote kills Testament, she just goes back to being a first ideal radiant. Like she doesn't, it doesn't completely go away. She just goes down to floor one, you know, not floor zero. Certainly the cryptics are willing to continue to investigate Shallan and eventually our pattern, modern pattern, is sent to bond her. He is probably one of these tall characters that she sees. Mm -hmm. But I would agree that there is like some floor above the first ideal that is probably very hard to go beneath because saying those words are... It's like a hard foundation to revert from. Yeah. And so as long as you're still kind of on the right path, uh, you can't fall back too far. But I And there is an element of I didn't I didn't put this on the timeline, but before Shalon becomes Yasna's ward, we see that flashback where she meets Wit at Mm -hmm. the middle fest or whatever. Yes. And she kind of inadvertently light weaves and going through her timeline and just like her the way that she accumulates power she's got a lot of power like pretty early on if she was legitimately just a baby baby radiant having like only first said the first ideal you know like even the fact that she's able to accidentally soul cast at this point i just feel like she clearly has maintained some of her powers Mm -hmm. and that indicates again that there is still this like bond or floor level radiance that's been happening yes and so the question is how much of that is because of testament a maybe still partially capable testament and where does our modern pattern come into play well, we think yeah, he is they're not bonded now. Exactly. Yeah. So they're definitely not bonded in Way of Kings and it's that early investigative phase, but I 
think that what's important is that while from a reader's perspective, it seems like Shallan has had a spren for a long time, it's actually almost perfectly in sync with Kaladin's progress in Way of Kings. As he is progressing with Syl, she is in that investigative phase. I think that's the haven't... point, though. We think it's the same. We think that they're discovering this like kind of at the same time, but they're not. Shallan's actually ahead of Kaladin. Well, I totally agree that she's ahead of Kaladin, but she, I think, is ahead of Kaladin with pattern and not just that she is having some type of previous relationship with Testament. I think that both You don't exist. think that this uh, quote that we just read of her soul casting has anything to do with Testament? I believe that it is giving her... I believe she's talking to Pattern in this moment, that the big ones that she's in front of. And I think that they are like willing to accept her previous work as a light weaver, as some like, uh, it's like a test, you know, an so you SAT think, type of thing. You think this like accidental soul casting is the moment that she bonds pattern? I don't believe that necessarily. <laughs> I But okay, so the question becomes like, can she do this soul casting without being bonded to pattern? You would have to say yes, but you think it's testament sourced. And I think that this is the cryptics, be they pattern or just the... Uh, scouting party, whoever it happens to be. I think it's them. Yeah, that's the thing. I think at this moment, there are multiple cryptics around and they're kind of all talking to her, mm -hmm. which is why I felt like this is not the bonding moment because there wasn't a clear relationship between her and a single spren. And so it like must be relying on her residual testament power because then later in the book... Um, when she is like confronting Yasna about the soul caster and Shadesmar and everything, then she like purposefully tries to go back to Shadesmar. She's like, I'll show you, watch this. And she purposefully like reaches out with her mind and is like, hey, cryptics, I need your help. Can I go back there? And a single cryptic replies to her and is like, okay. Tell me a truth. Tell me a really, really juicy one. What would you like to read through? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Quote, you need to tell me something true, it replied. The more true, the stronger our bond. Yasna is using a fake soul caster, Shalon thought. I'm sure that's a truth. That's not enough, the voice whispered. I must know something true about you. Tell me. The stronger the truth, the more hidden it is. The more powerful the bond. Tell me, tell me. What are you? What am I? Shallan whispered. Truthfully, it was a day for confrontation. She felt strangely strong, steady, time to speak it. I'm a murderer. I killed my father. Ah, the voice whispered. A powerful truth indeed. End quote. So to me, I think that is the moment when she first bonds with Pattern. I agree 100%, but I also think that that means she is at this moment a third ideal radiant that she bonded with pattern yes okay so that's, that's my thought is that this is ideal number three her truth being i'm a murderer i guess you could make an argument that the i am terrified like doesn't really count because as pattern says in that quote like that's not really a super juicy truth you know <laughs> So maybe it doesn't count. Um, but, but I I think that you're clear that there's now a one-to-one -one relationship with this cryptic that we think is our pattern. And Shalon is clearly this time saying a juicy truth. Yeah. And so this meets all of our thought process. So she is either a second ideal night yeah. radiant or, or third, third ideal. ideal at this moment in Way of Kings near the end and is now bonded to pattern this is pretty much the last thing that happens with her in way of kings and then when we pick back up with her in words of radiance we pretty much immediately see pattern in the physical realm as his pattern yeah <laughs> as, as his pattern uh on the ship but yeah how it's like embossed and he's always moving yeah the there you go stuff. embossed great word 
This is, of course, just a few weeks, maybe a month later. So Shalon is still 17. Yeah, I think it's, it's very quick. Yeah. And she will remain so because much of the events of Words of Radiance happen pretty quickly compared to something like mm-hmm. Oathbringer and Rhythm of War that take place over many, many weeks or even months at times. Yes. And then in terms of the events of Words of Radiance, that is really why... I say that I think the I am a murderer truth is her third ideal. So let's go through some of the events here. Obviously, on the boat, Yasna sort of explains to her, hey, you are becoming a third binder slash Knight's Radiant. And something that Yasna says that I think is super important that I just like kept coming back to throughout all of my note taking is that Yasna makes really clear the fact that the orders of Knights Radiance are just a way of codifying something that already exists. And that these, you know, specific names and specific like procedures around becoming a Knights Radiant is all a construction mm-hmm. and that like it doesn't necessarily have to be like this. And I think that that's just so important to keep in mind that, you know, we... Shalon's teacher is telling her the answer. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, we, yeah. the reader, are like, oh, obviously that doesn't apply. She's going to follow the exact same pattern as Kaladin, bridge boy extraordinaire. Right, and just that, like, there is just the idea that there are super clear cut first ideal equals this, second ideal mm-hmm. equals this, third ideal, you get your shard blade, fourth ideal, you get your shard plate. And like, it's not that, it's just not that clear cut. And Shalon is the perfect example of that because she's like said truths and then taken them away and then forgot about them, but they're still kind of there. And then she says them again and she kind of gets power up, but maybe not. And she like has a sword, but she doesn't. And maybe she has a shard blade. (laughs) When Shalon is on that ship with Yasna, it is of course attacked by the assassins sent by the Ghostbloods. And Shallan is going to perform this large amount of soul casting. Yeah. See, this is the other reason I think that at this point she has to be at least a third ideal. Because, again, we think she's about similar to Kaladin, but she does a lot, like, quite early on. She has relative ease in creating an illusion around herself to hide from the assassins. She creates a another, projection. yeah, where she sends a picture of herself like running away and then she soul casts the entire ship. Again, like, I don't know if, I mean, obviously Kaladin didn't do that much that early. That would have been like him, you know, flying around the first time we see him with Syl. Yeah, I mean, his early, think of how basic his early tests are it's you know sticking a rock to the wall and seeing if he can make that handholds and foothills going up but shallan is just bonded to pattern and is soul casting a ship yeah using multi- the same type of thing that she does at the end of oathbringer sending out waves of different uh illusions she's like performing the basic act right here basically without even thinking about it and so that I think lends credit to the concept that she is not a first time radiant. She is recovering something that she already had. Right. And it's kind of like the it's like riding a bicycle Mm -hmm. concept where she doesn't really have to think about it because she's so practiced. Like her body already knows, oh, I'm looking to hide creates a hiding illusion. To me, this is actually so perfect. If you think of what being a toddler was like, or if you have young children, that concept of, A, your brain is not developed enough to understand quite how you fit into the world, but you have a very powerful imagination and a very high amount of emotions that are just like flowing through your brain. And so if you were a young child and were blessed with the ability to be a light weaver, I would make so much cool stuff. Oh my gosh. Like you would just be like painting your room with imaginary lights all the time. Just every type of thing that you thought and imagined 
as you were like, you know, whatever, running around the park, but running around the park would become like a kaleidoscope of colors or whatever you happen to want it to be. It's certainly one of those things that in some ways like comes easier as a young child because you're not in your head as much. You're not thinking and worrying and like trying so hard. You're just being and doing and experiencing and probably a lot more honest when you have to tell yeah. those truths to get your power up. Totally. So I think that this is a huge show of power when she soul casts the ship. And it is something that will be like a good indicator for, you know, how powerful she is capable of becoming in the future as well. A few days after this, Shalon, you know, is on the road. She meets meets up with the uh, slave caravan. And there is a moment here when she's talking to Pattern. And we have, quote, You spoke oaths. Shalon froze. Life before death. The words drifted toward her from shadows of her past. A past she would not think of. You live lies, Pattern said. It gives you strength. End quote. There, I think, is our evidence that Shalon clearly said the first ideal somewhere way back in the past. We have not seen it, but she did say it at some point. And then, of course, their caravan meets up with good old Tin's caravan. And this is where Shalon starts to learn all of the things that she will later channel into Vale. Which we believe, because of the end of Rhythm of War... Veil already exists in mm. Shalon's mind. Yes, no. That's a I think it's still a question, but I have some arguments for when I think Veil is created. Okay. We'll get there. This I think is the first time we see Shalon actually summon her shard blade. She kills Tin and here we go. Quote, "Calm," Shalon told herself. "Be calm. 10 heartbeats." But for her, it didn't have to be 10, did it? No, it must be. Time. I need time. End quote. Definitely one of the first moments in the series that we get this hint that what we learned about 10 heartbeats may be a fallacy. Now, is that because Shalon has now bonded and is maybe a third level radiant with pattern yeah and she can summon a spren blade instantaneously right or is that closer to a reference about what adolin has discovered in his relationship with maya that if you have a close bond with a dead eye spren as shallan does have a close bond with testament maybe no no i think that undoubtedly Adolin is able to develop a close bond with Maya, though he is not her original human. Yeah, yeah. Shallan definitely has a strong bond with Testament that cannot go away because she is Testament's reason for existing. Like, I think that that is the main underlying thing that makes them closer than just a regular shard blade would be with a regular user. Yeah, I think there's a question here as to which blade this is that Mm -hmm. kills tin i think that it is testament blade i think she draws testament blade and uses it to kill tin because at that time she is also having pattern uh do distraction work so pattern is like running around doing some voices so because he's like running around i think that her blade has to be testament i think You could make an argument either way, but that's mine. So I do think that there is an interesting question about Deadeye Blades being able to be summoned in less than 10 heartbeats. I would think that if she knows that it can be summoned in less than 10, it is probably something that she has done before. I don't know. I'm just like very question of like, why does she think in the first place, that 10 heartbeats are needed. It started as a spring blade, which doesn't need 10 heartbeats at all. And now well, it's because a dead... she's trying to pretend like it's not. Yeah, yeah. I, that's what I think is she's saying 10 heartbeats, 10 heartbeats, because she's 
pretending. She's like, I need it to just be a regular shard blade. Yes. And so this is why, to me as the reader, I was more convinced that Shallan's mother, or maybe father, but Shallan's mother was a regular shard blade wielder. Yeah, and I mean, that's what we're supposed to think. killed her, she got the shard blade mm-hmm. or was like using the shard blade to, anyways, but that pattern of blades being handed over to the one who defeats them. Yeah. I thought that's what Shallan did. And so it just like popped into existence after her mother or her father died and she got to pick it up. But of course, she had this blade all along. And so I think that's really the point is that every time she says 10 heartbeats, that's a lie to herself. Yeah. And this is when you just get into Shallan as an unreliable narrator because the information that we want so bad about the shard blades and the magic system that her spren is her most unreliable yeah. category. <laughs> like everything she says is a lie wrapped in trauma, wrapped in an enigma, and it is just spren blades all the way down. <laughs> After this, she makes her way to the Shattered Plains, of course. She gets settled. And now we are in 1173, month 10. And she and Pattern start to explore her abilities. And then there is this scene that is, I think, very important. It's one of her first nights there Again, she and Pattern are like, you know, figuring stuff out, trying to figure out the light weaving. And Pattern really gently like tries to get her to remember her before times. He's really like, come on, Shalon, like you gotta, you gotta, you gotta snap out of it. You know how to do this. We've done this before, you know, come, come on into the light. And she's like, nope, shuts him down super hard. And she shows him a vision of like, quote unquote, who she really is, which is like this sad girl just curled up in a ball. And she says of that vision, quote, she could not laugh for laughter had been squeezed from her by a childhood of darkness and pain. That was the real Shalon. She knew it as surely as she knew her own name. The person she had become instead was a lie, one she had fabricated in the name of survival. To remember herself as a child, discovering light in the gardens, patterns in the stonework and dreams that became real Mm, such a deep lie pattern whispered a deep lie indeed but still you must obtain your abilities learn again if you have to end quote and then immediately after that moment is when she first draws and creates veil so a couple of things for the audio listeners the words light in discovering light in the gardens and pattern in patterns in the stonework are both capitalized light and pattern i think that this is why my argument for veil being created for the child shallan is this scene right here is that she feels like this little girl who's like up in a ball and needs protection And says the person she had become instead was a lie she had fabricated in the name of survival. To me, the thing that she fabricated was Veil. I don't think so. I think you're on the right track. But I think this is, I think it's a separate personality. And I think we talked about this a little bit the last time we did a more in-depth look at Shallan. The fact that the, there's a possibility that the Shallan that we have been calling Shallan is actually also a fabrication and is like her first created persona Mm -hmm. and that Shallan will not truly be herself until she like reincorporates this sad sad ball (laughs) Shallan that's what I'll call her excellent so (laughs) you think there's internal sad ball Shallan and then there is who I show to the world, Shalon. Yep. And then there is Veil. Vale, and, and then, then there's there Radiant. Radiant. Yeah, like I think when we've been talking about the three, Shalon, Veil, vale, Radiant, I think they're all fabricated personas and that Shalon is actually not the real Shalon. Wouldn't just... this give way to the formless argument? Is that formless is sad ball Shalon? <laughs> Grown up, obviously. <sighs> kind of, yeah. I think that there is a 
possibility, like I hear that argument and I think it's a strong one as well. I really kind of connect this idea that she thinks this thought about how she fabricated someone to survive and then literally the next thing she does is draw a veil and bring her into existence. It's almost like something that we'll talk about later, but she uses the veil as a type of shard plate to protect her from uh, the dangers around. But like, I think that those two just being so close that this moment of saying I fabricated someone well, I and think, then drawing veil is so like I think why there's a I difference mm-hmm. because in Rhythm of War, when Shalon has that conversation with Vale, finally like confronting her. The unveiling. <laughs> yes. You're very welcome, everyone. Take that to the bank. <gasps> oh my god, I'm check you can that. cash. During the unveiling, Vale quite literally says, I am that blank part of your memory. Like Veil vale is the part of Shalon's mind that goes catatonic that we see many, many mm-hmm. times throughout the series. When Shalon tries to think about her past, it's that catatonic wiping of her mind to protect her. And then But I think there's a difference between the less magical, let's say, I don't want to call it normal, but the less magical version, which is just the catatonic staring at a wall. I think Veil vale is like the physical persona of that part of her mind that Shalon takes something that has always existed since she was a very small child and like pushes it into a real thing that has a face and thoughts and a personality. That's a great call. And I like that idea of, you know, taking something in the mind and then pushing it into reality because that's what creators do and and light weavers. And that, so again, like you said, that's what she's talking about right here. She's talking about the way that she has been protecting herself from her past. And then she immediately like channels that feeling, that need into the creation of Veil, literally and physically in this scene. So I think Veil, you know, capital V, the person Veil doesn't exist until this moment. Okay. But that doesn't mean that her mental process that Wasn't, becomes Veil didn't it. already okay. exist. I can totally get on board that bandwagon. Let us know what you think on Twitter or Facebook or Reddit or Patreon, where you can be a <laughs> patron and get extra bonus content. Until then, though, we want to continue right down the path diving back in we're only in words of radiance we're just gonna (laughs) push right through because shallan and kaladin have a huge not only character growth moment not only a relationship moment for those who ship kaladin and even if shaladin yeah you shaladin fans the shaladin fans out there this is their creme de la creme this is their moment upon moment it's a great scene it's a great scene on all fronts even if there's not romantic it's very good for their relationship overall i think that this moment in the chasms where they discover something weird about each other mm-hmm. and they each come to a greater appreciation of one another is One of those perfect examples of writing where you're getting everything you want because you get the character growth and those moments, and that's lovely, but you also get Shalon revealing her shard blade to someone else. Yes. This is the first time. Super important moment for Shalon's shard blade uh, journey. Yes. She reveals her shard blade. Obviously, Kaladin's like, WTF, why do you have a shard blade? She gives the shard blade to Kaladin And Kaladin specifically notes that it does not scream in his head. Now, that can really only mean one thing to me. And this was my first reading, uh, supported by what happens slightly after. They're trying to cut out little sections in the rock wall to protect themselves. Shallan is like, it's too unwieldy to cut at this angle and then shrinks down the blade. But I think this is her pattern blade and that's why it doesn't scream in kaladin's mind is because it's a living spren blade i think that's the most likely scenario because it doesn't scream it changes shape 
We don't actually know for sure if if we can rule out testament because unlike in the tin scene, in this scene, we are seeing it all from Kaladin's point of view. Mm-hmm. So we don't actually know if Pattern is still running around with Shallan as she's creating illusions and like trying to help Kaladin. But I think most likely it's Pattern Blade. And there's also this quote, quote, better if she'd been able to send the illusions on Pattern, but it was problematic because... End quote. (laughs) I think we have to imagine this as the first appearance of the pattern blade. Agree. However, there is a countervailing theory that this could be if Shallan was still unable to summon pattern as a blade, that this could be an example of what is possible with, with a dead eye blade. A dead eye blade that you have regained uh, a yes. connection with. Yeah. So that was my question was like, well, Testament Blade already seems like kind of weird, you know, can be potentially summoned in less than 10 heartbeats. So mm-hmm. maybe it doesn't scream. So obviously, the question that we could, or the experiment we could run to solve this problem is that, with their permission, clearly, you could have Maya and testament blade be summoned by adolin and shallan and then each of them given to another radiant like right. kaladin or someone else mm-hmm. and if those blades scream in their heads then we know pretty certainly that that's just always going to be part of dead eye shard blades and that this was definitely pattern blade but i don't think we know that and that this whole Mm-mm. exploration of shallan we are setting up these like two parallel timelines of is this all patterns work or is this subtly a different type of relationship with a spren blade paralleling again adolin and maya i was like oh my god they have so much in common it would be (laughs) such an unveil and if this is why brandon went back and started to rewrite adolin into a broader character Mm -hmm. and really expand upon him in every single book he was joking in the recent spoiler filled Cosmere live stream that the books kept getting longer and longer because now each one had to have 10,000 like to 20,000 words for Adolin. Character arc. Yeah, because he needs to have a perfect. I do arc. not regret that. Nobody like, does. Number one great choice. Brandon, I know you're listening. Big fan of the pod. <laughs> Thank you for Adolin. That's all I need to say. And if it is unveiled that Adolin is going to go on the journey that Shallan has already been on in establishing well, some I think, new relationship. Yeah, they're with kind their of data. both going on it at of the course. same time, really. Yes. And that's so cool. Their relationship together is so twinsies. Uh, they're so cute. <laughs> um then of course we go on to the Battle of Narok and discovering Urethiru. Uh at this point Shallan is discovering the oath gates, you know, the first oath gate that they find. She figures out how it works. She tells Adolin to put his shard blade, aka Dead Eye Maya, into the oath gate to make it work. It doesn't work. So she grabs the blade and pulls it out. Again, this is Dead Eye Maya. Dead Eye Maya screams in her mind. She then commands pattern specifically. She specifically says, Pattern, become a blade. And then she uses that to work the oath gate. So I guess maybe we just answered our own question. If Maya screams in Shallan's head, then that previous blade that she gives to Kaladin must have been Pattern Blade. No, I would think because Maya is theoretically in this alternate version that we've created. Maya is not at the same position in that moment. Oh, because the Testament Adolin is at hasn't with, really yes. bonded with her yet. Mm, exactly. Good argument. Good argument. I'm saying Testament is already at a level of, let's call it quasi-bonding or semi-bonded with Shallan, and Adolin is not there yet, but by the end of Rhythm of War, would considered to be there. Yeah. And perhaps if that is the case, that Adolin is now quasi-bonded with Maya, I would think that Testament could do similar things that Maya can do. For example, Testament could be speaking to Shallan in the same way that Maya speaks to Adolin. Yeah, 
That's a but good we point. Seen That's a good point. We don't see Adolin summon Maya in less than 10 heartbeats until the end of Oathbringer. Mm-hmm. So at that point, Maya would be closer to what Testament is now yeah okay but we st- so we haven't completely ruled it out but yeah it's not uh not looking great for if you were real fans of the testament <laughs> theory then at the very end of uh words of radiance pattern forces shallan to confront her patricide killing of her father there is a fan theory that i saw that i think holds up that this moment this acknowledging her patricide is what causes her mental decline throughout Oathbringer and Rhythm of War up until the very end of Rhythm of War at the unveiling. I really do think that this is a good theory because, as I said, once you have some of these pieces back in their place it becomes impossible not to see the fact that like she's the cause of everything like all of her trauma is circling around these mm. moments and if you start putting you know four or five pieces back into the circular puzzle you're going to pretty quickly realize it's a circle and that could be very depressing of just being like oh she's yeah. already she you know subconsciously she already knows what she did she has right. the whole story yeah. in her head. And so it's just realizing. And if you're on that path of realizing and it's just like, I killed my father because of X, Y, Z. And we get on yeah. this loop again. Yeah. So here is where, you know, pretty much up until Oathbringer, like Shalon seems to be managing just fine. You know, like she's more or less a regular person, like going along happy ish she has and not then, shown any of her multiple personalities at this point right i guess we get we, well the, yeah so we get pattern trying to force her to confront veil appears then we get this moment where she's being forced to acknowledge killing her mother and almost immediately after which we don't necessarily notice because there's a book break but almost immediately after she creates radiant And so definitely, and this is what Pattern says in Rhythm of War when they're having their breakdown slash heart to heart. He said, I was wrong. I made a mistake trying to force you to remember. And so I think that you're exactly on point is that Pattern was doing something wrong. And in the moments when he forced her to remember and to level up, she mentally split off another character. Yeah, he is like, poking holes in the armor that she needs to be a functioning human. And so because she doesn't have that anymore, she has to create something new, which is her personas. Man, such a deep exploration of the psyche and how people process trauma in different ways. There is, I was just listening to another podcast that was talking about in a real life situation about how someone was dealing with their elderly parent who had Alzheimer's, which Mm. of course is a disease that takes away people's memories over time. And they said, you know, one of the things that was really important was when I stopped trying to correct them all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, they were somewhere and doing something. leaned into the delusions. And it's just like, am I lying to my parent in this situation? Am I, you know, just going along with their delusions, as you said? Yes, but when there needed to be a medical decision made, the mother was comfortable enough and trusted the daughter enough to allow her to make this important medical decision. And it's just kind of like, you can think that the most important thing is to get someone to tell the truth <laughs> and to just be like, oh, you know, you're doing it wrong. And you're, you can be the pattern who's just like trying to poke holes, but that may not be what that person needs what that person like needs the best in thing that for moment. them yes. yeah and shalon clearly didn't need that <laughs> didn't in this react moment. well because yeah. <laughs> she created veil and then radiant and is really gonna go downhill quickly oh man when is kaladin gonna make that mental hospital on roshar <laughs> it's badly needed yeah they need help someone help them <laughs> there is also an argument i saw online that this moment when Shalon sort of sees a vision of her mother's death, if that counts as a truth or an ideal, 
if that is an up-leveling moment for her. Um, it is an acknowledgement, but she doesn't actually say anything out loud like she does when she says, I'm a murderer, I killed my father. She doesn't say, I killed my mother out loud. So that's a question mark in terms of, is that a fourth ideal or not? That question becomes important, especially to past us and our theorizing, because in 1174, there is the Kolinar mission resulting in epic failure, all the way up to the Battle of Thalen Fields, aka the events of Oathbringer, and taking place during Shallan's 18th year, all of which are important because we have her personalities diverging more clearly probably as a way to heal her from the trauma we just talked about. Uh, but they are also starting to set up the structures of agreement and disagreement that we'll see play out a bunch in Rhythm of War. Somewhat. Yeah, exactly. It's it's beginning. We have many revelations with wit, including the flashback that you already mentioned, but also the girl who looked up story. Yes. With the aid of wit suspected shallan is able to create illusions that actually have physical substance they feel like something they're not just light shadows that you can kind of wave your hand through maybe that is just wit's influence but i think that that's part of the argument that maybe that scene at the end of uh words of radiance was a fourth ideal maybe she is leveled up a little bit and then we also see that during the Battle of Thalen Field, we see all three of her personalities fighting together. They're creating illusion soldiers that, again, have at least some substance to them. And then, of course, we see Radiant appearing in shard plate? Question mark. Is this real shard plate? It is speculated so heavily because when Yasna approaches Shallan's three in that moment, it is radiant that solidifies and and is like here I am. Yes, and then the shard plate disintegrates off of her, and she like becomes Shalon again. But it is seemingly that Shalon had shifted over to become a radiant in shard plate. In so that's that why. So that this, would... the speculation exists that she's a fourth ideal at this point, which mm -hmm. is maybe that vision, or maybe there was some other ideal or truth said in... yeah like way far in the past that what we think is the second ideal is actually the third ideal who knows <laughs> these light weavers they're hard to so nail down complicated i think it's important to go back on this point though to go back to what yasna was saying and what brandon has said in terms of there being differentiations between orders and like not everything is always clear so we don't necessarily know if fourth ideal equals shard plate like maybe she is the third ideal and she just has her shard plate like that's possible too I completely agree, and we've definitely like mentioned that as we're going through all these heavily theorized things, we always kind of end or parenthesize ourselves by just being like, or she could just be able to manifest it early. Yeah, like, like we, there's so much that we don't know. I really do love this idea that we took the most rigid of orders in the Windrunners and then tried to apply that to everyone. To everything. And we were just like, of course, the cryptics and light weavers are going to look identical to the militaristic honor bound wind runners that makes it because we're just learning and we're just trying to yeah. apply any set and that's what brandon does so great is that every time we think we know something he either shows us a little it's bit like, more actually or life's a little bit more out. complicated than yeah. that <laughs> okay this brings us to rhythm of war obviously the most important moment is the unveiling and there's some interesting quotes here between Vale and Shallan which I think may have some bearing on like what exactly Vale is and what her function is. Some of this we've kind of already been through. Quote, I killed my own father. I strangled him with my own hands. The words cut deep like a spike through the heart. Vale winced visibly. But that cut to the heart somehow left warm blood bleed out, flowing through her. You have borne that truth for a year and a half, Shallan, Vale said, stepping forward. You kept going. 
You were strong enough. You made the oath. And mother, Shallan snapped, do you remember the feel of the blade forming in our hands for the first time, Vale? I do. Do you remember the horror I felt at the strike which I never meant to make? Vale whispered, I've protected you all these years, but it's time for me to leave. It's time for me to be done. I know what you are, Shallan whispered. You're the blankness upon my memories, the part of me that looks away, the part of my mind that protects me from my past, end quote. And then I think she says, I'm your veil, Shallan. She does. Yeah. She's like, yeah, of course, I'm your veil. <laughs> and then we're all like, oh. So that unveiling is, of course, also a reabsorption of those memories. And that is a key part of what happens in that moment is that the blanked out moments, the things that were designed to protect Shallan and when Veil vale stepped in are now one. And we believe that by the end of Rhythm of War, Veil vale is no longer. Yeah. But the Shallan that exists has become all the best parts of Veil, vale, but also yep. those hard moments. And that's what Veil vale says. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm not anything that you are not. Like, we are we. During this exchange, Veil vale also forces Shallan to confront her previous spren testament and there is again this type of thing where she sees a light weaver-esque vision of one of these truths that she has suppressed and it's like does that count as a truth for her ideals or not and brandon has been asked this multiple times so he was asked by Insulatus 47. Does Shallan's I killed my spren count as a truth? And responds with, in Brandon fashion, a very long answer. Here we go. Quote, I'm going to leave that up to theorizing, figuring out the timeline that's going on with Shallan. What we can say is that Shallan is reconstructing, in many cases, oaths she has said before. And it is working slightly differently than someone who is saying new oaths. And indeed, saying she killed her spren is one of those steps. I'll leave it to you to try to parse through that. It's actually pretty complicated. We have a nice big page explaining all of this stuff internally to make sure that we're keeping it all straight. Because she has violated oaths and reconstructed them is basically what's happening. And she is regressing and she's doing a 1.1 steps forward, one step back sort of thing. Kind of frequently. End quote. And I think that is perfect. Again, just keeping in mind that these things are much more fluid than we think they are. And we are creating a tiny little version of the big page with explanations <laughs> basically, for Shallan and her timeline here. And I think there is an aspect of like, it's not that she's swearing new, new ideas. oaths. Yeah. But she's said the truths, and then she has suppressed the truths, and so she's still kind of a radiant, but not, and then she's becoming more radiant, but not for the first time, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's where some of this, like, weird power stuff with her is coming from, like, why is she still bonded to the Testament Blade, and why the soul casting and illusion making come so much easier to her in the very beginning, things like that, because the the ideals or the truths that she's said are not gone completely. They're not destroyed. They're just in the darkness. <laughs> and there may be some, we'll call them capital T truths, that she has to say, but in order to say that, she also has to admit things that are true. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, kind of like your callback to Venli, where Venli has sort of a long process of like mm -hmm. first, you know, processing it just kind of within her own mind of like, hmm, okay, I think that this is kind of the feeling of what my next oath is going to be. And then she, you know, processes that for a while until she finally says it out loud. So it might kind of be something like that. So we see Shallan definitely grow a lot. And we think that she is somewhere around the fourth ideal by the end of Rhythm of War. She has solidified or absorbed Veil, vale, but is still keeping Radiant as a distinct, quote unquote, personality. I suspect that the same type of thing is going to happen with Radiant. That yeah. Radiant is also 
covering up something very large in Shalon's life, and that will be part of her continued growth. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'll be the same kind of thing where Vale was created to do a specific thing in that specific moment when Shalon was like pushed too far. And then when Shalon is able to acknowledge or like move forward in some way, Radiant will also be able to be reabsorbed once she is like done fulfilling her purpose. In terms of the context of the plot, she is also set up in perhaps the most exciting of ways. Definitely. Like she is going head on against the ghost bloods. You've made an enemy of Thytokar Kelsier. You've made an enemy of Moraes and his chicken. And I'm most <laughs> afraid of the chicken in that combination. Oh uh, but I think that she has the potential of being a world hopper. Yeah. And that's going to, I think, bring up a and bunch like of problems. like a Cosmere scholar. Certainly I, like a Chris scholar. I feel so excited for like where Shalon could go in the future. I think she has some really cool stuff on the horizon if she can just get her brain into a better space. I also don't think something like Harold is out of the oh question for Shalon. If you can be a world hopper, she could be a herald. Like if I they're doing that reforming the oath path I thing. I don't think they're going to. If maybe. they do, it's a mistake. <laughs> you heard it here first, Brandon. Don't do that. We've already talked about that. Like why? Why would you reforge the oath pack? That sounds like a bad idea. Let's actually go over to Brandon for another word of his Yes, in terms of Shalon's oaths, here's another word of Brandon as to her weirdness. He said, quote, Every order's first oath is the same. Then the second oaths for the cryptics go into truths. But everybody says the first oath the same, regardless of order, which should raise the question of... Did Shalon say it when she was a teeny weeny, like in the cradle? That should raise a question. She wasn't teeny weeny, but it should raise a question there, end quote. And as we have said in this episode, we believe it was some time around her toddler years, maybe not yeah. actual baby in the cradle, Small child. but pretty dang young. And the fact that we are learning so much and gaining so much information and perspective from a light weaver who are in an inherently weird, not an organization that has a rigid hierarchy is difficult it makes yeah, things harder because if you think like in terms of kaladin you know we've always been saying you know break your oaths what if he breaks his oath because he's taken an oath and then if you've taken an oath you can break your oath but light weavers don't actually take oaths yeah they just say a truth right like so it's not quite the same type of thing where you're like well you can't really break a truth because it's what still you true. can do is suppress it. Yes. <laughs> so I think that is the the parallel. Suppressing a truth for a light weaver is the same as breaking an oath for a wind runner. I find that dichotomy or that relationship and about suppression to be really interesting, especially because of the history of multiple personality disorder, which has come to be called dissociative identity disorder and clearly Shalon is dealing with some aspect of this but it's complex like I went yeah. into a deeper rabbit hole of trying to learn about the history of mm. DID mm -hmm. and when it was multiple personality disorder and there is a lot of of something we've mentioned on the podcast before previously as well, but hysteria oh God. and multiple personality disorder have a lot in common in that it's doctors, often white men, who are diagnosing women with diseases so that they can give treatments to things that are more along the lines of just trauma or difficulties sure. and yeah. their interpersonal yeah. relationships or their sexual relationships or whatever. But then that becomes a diagnosis from a doctor. And like the first doctor who in quote unquote invented and found multiple personality disorder was pretty much a fraud and like was force creating a person to tell oh, a story I about how story they were too. having multiple personality disorders. I do 
like, I don't want to take away from anyone's personal experience, though. You know what I mean? Like, just because there's bad egg doesn't mean that there aren't people out there who experience this. I don't want to say that, like, DID doesn't exist. I think that what we should take away, though, is that it is not something that's simplistic. Oh, It is yeah. not as easy as saying, Shalon, the real person, has three distinct personalities that represent themselves at three at distinct sure. times. Mm-hmm. It is something more akin to there is a person who is dealing with trauma by repressing and temporarily accessing memories that they have as a defense mechanism. And it's like a big flow. It's all jumbled up together rather than like, and here's Vale, the plucky <laughs> drinker. Sure, who, who has nothing to do with Shalon. Yes. Like, like Vale says, like, we are we. Yes. And I think that Brandon's handling it really well. It's obviously something that he has put a lot of work into trying to understand how these disorders manifest themselves and the variation that exists. But it is difficult because of its complexity. To move on to something lighter, another fan theory is the potential that Vale is Shalon's shard plate. I did drop this as like a little hint earlier. Yeah, the just a fan Phil- theory, which I kind of like because if you think about it, like what are Lightweavers going to do with sh- like actual shard plate? The big kind of bulky yeah, gear. Yeah, like for the most part, they're functioning as spies. Like their whole thing is to sort of be unnoticed. Having shard plate would like completely defeat the purpose of their, you know, illusions and hiding and sneaking. And as we've seen, the actual spren plate has no problem shifting around as we, yeah. it does on Kaladin. Yeah. Like it can be different sizes. It can be different opacities. Opacities? Anyways, tell me how to say that word. <laughs> It can be on a different person. It can be like thrown to another individual. But I think that this concept that shard plate doesn't have to look like shard plate does in our mind is great I when it comes to the spring plate. I love that idea for the light waver is that their shard plate, quote unquote, might appear in very different ways, such as this way, as Veil I mean, she literally says that she functions as Shalon's protection, that she is there to protect Shalon. <laughs> and like, what else does Shardplate do? Especially since Vale, like I said, is literally created out of that concept of Shalon's mind protecting itself when she's talking to Pattern. Do you think that there is a secondary spren that is operating in the way that we see the wind spren operate for Kaladin or what we think are those geometric spren for hmm. Yasna because Good we haven't question. seen any other spren around Shalon but she is one of our highest ranked radiants yeah. so like where's that other spren what would it be well we do see a bunch of spren around her in way of kings again when she's like first seeing all of the cryptics there's a bunch of them but just cryptics not a Oh, Sub-spren. yeah, that's a good point. Like the wind spren. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, like what's the what's the lower version of a lie spren? And I, that's question. why I think that it's a very interesting concept of like the creation of a shard plate is kind of like the creation of a Jedi's lightsaber. You know, it's this thing that they have to manifest themselves as part of their trials to move forward. And in order to have shard plate as a light weaver you have to create an illusion so strong that it manifests as your plate i love that and so it's not a secondary spren but if you happen to know what the secondary spren of the cryptics is or the sub spren however you want to phrase it let us know on twitter reddit facebook and patreon Another interesting quote that someone on the internet pointed out in relation to Shalon's shard plate that I thought was very interesting. I had not read it in this way before, but I kind of love it. It is chapter 15 of Oathbringer. So super early towards the beginning. Again, we kind of forget about it because there's a book break, but this is essentially immediately after they have found Uri Thiru, Shalon has had that vision acknowledging killing her mother. She's kind of freaking out. 
Adolin's like, hey, great news. You have a shard blade. This is the best thing ever. Yes. Let's, so giddy. let's practice with it. And Shallan starts having a panic attack. She cannot stop thinking about this vision that she's seen. Everything in her brain is just like, I killed my mom. I killed my mom. I killed my mom with that shard blade. I can't tell you that. She starts panicking. She doesn't want to acknowledge the shard blade. She doesn't want to hold it. Adolin's like, let's duel. She's like, please no, please no. He then asks her, quote, What about plate? Do you have that hidden away somewhere too? Not that I know of, she said. Her heart was beating quickly, her skin growing cold, her muscles tense. She fought against the sensation. I don't know where I don't know where plate comes from, end quote. And so if that growing cold muscles tense and a sensation that she has had before and is maybe fighting against what if that is the summoning of her plate she then immediately creates radiant and that to me is like what we have seen before she is taking in processing something and then instead of dealing with it she shifts it around and like redirects it oh it's like a avatar redirecting the lightning she's just taking in that negative energy and redirecting it into a veil or a radiant so here's my thought she confronts murdering her father and gets her shard blade third ideal she confronts murdering her mother That is associated with her next bump to her shard plate. I think she has like had it before, but because again, we're like resurfacing these things. Mm -hmm. I think dad is connected to shard blade. Mom is connected to shard plate. She says that like she can't get rid of the shard blade truth. Basically, she's like, can't get rid of that like shard blades here to stay and then she creates radiant so i think she's kind of like well i have to make concessions somewhere the blade is now undeniable but i refuse to acknowledge my mom's death and i refuse to acknowledge my shard plate and to push those things away she creates radiant who of course is good with the blade and wears (laughs) plate yeah in the key moments. That's my thought. That's a good way of explaining and understanding. And back to what we were just talking about, the real disease of DID, that what you just described to me is far closer to what actual descriptions are, is that it is like the trauma is coming in. These people are experiencing the trauma and then they bundle that up and move it into a quote-unquote identity or personality personality, but that it's not so much a separate personality yeah i mean i think that's why they changed the name of the disease right dissociative identity and because of the connections to fraud and the founder well sure but yeah like i think to the point like it's not a completely separate thing yes you have just dissociated from something i think that's the important inclusion is that word dissociate because like the you that exists is dissociating right and you are taking some of that and putting it over here but like you can get it back anytime you want it's right there and as we see from shalon she takes back in those pieces i am very curious if perhaps one of the things that will unlock shalon's full potential as a world hopper is a fifth ideal that like releases her from Rashar or allows her to because I don't want her to lose pattern obviously to become a world hopper but I want her to become a world hopper so she has to dissociate herself from her identity that is Rasharian. oh that's interesting like maybe all of all of this did experience will actually be like her superpower Mm -hmm. and the thing that enables her because we know that capital i identity is a cosmere Uh aspect that can be manipulated or worked with i really like that and that really ties into like what adolin tells her and then what she like takes and tells herself Mm -hmm. in rhythm of war which is like our struggles are what make us strong yes the the reason that you know the person who is the most who has the most emotional fortitude 
is the person who has suffered and struggled and experienced things. The person who has had, you know, a perfectly happy life is not going to be very emotionally strong. Yeah. It's the person who's suffered. And so I love that maybe that will be expanded and that, again, like her suffering will become her strength. Ooh. You really, heard it here first, kids. Well, I want her to be able to do that. And I want her to be able to do it for other people. In my imagination, it is. Mm, I don't know about that. No, I want her to do it for Wit. Like, oh. I, Wit needs to get off planet too. And so he hmm. either needs to figure out the same thing Shalon figures out, become a fifth ideal radiant in his own right. But I could also see it being like Shalon's resonant point. Or her just special ability. Uh, but like, Wit needs to get off planet. And I want Shalon to become a world hopper. So she needs to get off planet. And I don't want them to lose their spread. I think there's going to be a different way for that to happen. Yeah. But I mean, it could be a whole we'll bunch see. of like breaking of Rashar as everything collapses. Oh, God. Let's get to our Stormlight Archive explained badly. This comes from Paul Rando. Quote, the adventures of one incredible stick with some human and crab sidekicks. <laughs> if you have a Stormlight Archive explained badly, please send it to us. We love to hear them. They are hilarious. If you have any thoughts on Shalon or her personalities or Testament. Tell us everything that we got wrong about yes. real life DID. <laughs> It's going to be a lot, and I'm totally okay with that, but I think that hopefully this exploration of Shallan's timeline will serve as a great reminder in the future of where Shallan has been, how yeah. all of the disconnected aspects of her story fit together, and will allow us to best see the Shallan of the future and what she could become in book five. Until next time. Life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. 